everybody to uh, another in the uh, continuing series of events from uh, the Doctoral Scholars Program. Uh, today we are addressing the issue of uh, achieving tenure and getting uh, and receiving advice from for early career faculty. So we hope all of you fit that role in uh, that description. Uh, today's webinar, we are talking about uh, what we at the, within the Doctoral Scholars Program have certainly focused on, and that's diversifying the professoriate. Uh, as all of you know, that has long been a, a real priority on all of your camp, uh, on most of your campuses, if not all of your campuses. Um, and it certainly has been and remains the goal of the SREB Doctoral Scholars Program. Um, However, despite all of that focus on the issue of faculty diversity uh, in higher education, we've not seen a significant increase in the diversity of faculty, particularly the diversity of tenured faculty. And we thought it would be really good to have uh, and get advice and have some discussion around the preparation of early career faculty um, for that tenure process. And we have two, fin uh, two not finalists, they are panelists with us today, uh, who uh, have both been there, done that. Um, our first panelist today is um, Dr. Veronica Acosta, uh, excuse me, Veronica Martinez Acosta. Uh, she is a professor of biology and director of the honors program at the University of the Incarnate Word in San Antonio, Texas. Um, she earned her PhD in zoology from Texas A&M University. Uh, Dr. Acosta has won numerous awards um, for, from her university on teaching and service. And um, I'd just like to say she is a 2005 P, um, program graduate uh, uh, and we are very thrilled and pleased to have uh, you here, uh, Veronica. We appreciate, as always, when we call and ask for volunteers that you're always right up front trying to contribute and give back to the scholars who are coming along the program these days. Uh, we also have with us Dr. Kasanya, also known as Kay Whitehead. She is an Associate Professor of Communications in African American Studies at Loyola University of Maryland and is the founding director of the Carson Institute for Race, Peace, uh, and Social Justice. She is also the host of an award-winning radio program today with Dr. Uh, Dr. K on WEAA in the Maryland and DC area. She too, as you all might have guessed, is very accomplished. And uh, Dr. Whitehead, we are again thrilled that you have agreed to come and uh, also give back and um, commit to the scholars who are having to deal with some of these issues and engage us quite frankly in some of the discussion around the, the task of getting tenured once one has secured a tenure track position. And I thought what we do is I'll ask a couple of questions and I'll just get this conversation started and let the two of you weigh in on some of this. So let me first uh, ask Dr. Acosta this question and start with you anyway. Um, what does tenure review process look like at most institutions? You know, what, is, what does that look like at most places? And obviously you, you have the experience of your own institution. Right, so I'll say that um, I am at a predominantly undergraduate institution, but um, the discussions that we all have in our um, various training pathways is that um, the tenure process involves uh, a review of your teaching, scholarship, and service uh, during your time at the university. And this process can be, or this evaluation is over uh, a seven year, or up to seven year period of time um, at the institution that you are, that you are with at that time. And so I like to think of it as like a three pronged stool. Uh, and so you have the scholarship, the teaching and service that you're being evaluated on, but that 
those the length of the legs on that stool may be different depending on what institution that you're at. Uh, the last thing I'll add is that many institutions also have as a part of the review process a discussion of what committee members will call fit at the institution. And that's where we get into some, you know, language and challenges that, you know, where there are unwritten rules, one would say, about the process itself that we can talk about. So maybe I'll go ahead and chime in while uh, Dr. A is coming back. It's a little bit similar at my institution. I too am at a predominantly undergraduate institution where teaching and service in so many ways we're told during the six year process that it's about what happens in the classroom in terms of how we're evaluated by our students and then how we in service to the university. There, there's a notion that when you are pre-tenure, you should not take on a lot of service. And this is where you have to find out about the, the environment of your institution. Because at some places you can have a senior scholar who can protect you and say, you know what, no, Dr. Whitehead can't do this. She really needs to focus on fill in the blank of whatever the research is you're doing. And at some institutions that, that fourth leg called FIT is based upon how much you commit to all of the things that are not noted in your contract. Like how often do you show up for events with students, events with faculty? How many panels are you actually participating in? Are you there for parents weekend? Like all of the unwritten rules that determine the fit. And that's why I tell people you gotta figure out, get some friends, get some allies on campus who can spell out to you the unwritten rules that make up the environment of your campus because that is where people fail. Because you just wanna focus on your teaching, you focus on your research, you try to do some scholarship, you try to do some service, but you don't show up for things because you frankly don't have time. But if that's an institution that really values faculty members being present in the space, they want to see your face and know that you are committed to the overall goals of the institution, then, then that's a fourth leg that you don't even know you're being evaluated on, but you are. And that evaluation, I would argue, starts before you even step on campus. That evaluation starts when you're doing the interview process, where they're trying to figure out whether or not you fit with the institution. The problem with that, and I think we should be very honest about this, is that a lot of that fit is based in notions of white supremacy because we tend to have committees that are made up of predominantly white, older men for the most part. And when they look for fit, they look for someone who is just like them, even though they may not even be aware that that's what they're doing. And so they have problems with people who don't fit in that mold, who are not in the areas and spaces where they expect you to be. And when you push back against that, having that protection of a senior scholar to speak up for you, to advocate for you, to, to be your voice when you're not in the room, that matters in moments like that. Thank you, I appreciate that. So for both of you, so, and, and you think about the, could you all talk a little bit about that, the process of, I mean, when you, you I think uh, um, Dr. Costa, you mentioned that, uh, you know, that, that process is a six, seven year process to get there. Um, but there's also this, this thing called pre-tenure review. Does, do both, did both of you do that? Do, does your school have that? Do most schools have that uh, pre-tenure reviews? I've heard, um, horror stories about going through some of those, uh, that, that, that review process, um, because it is some places less formal uh, and more or less up to the individuals, the department head or whoever conducts that within your, within your school. Um, could you all speak to the timeline that one usually goes through uh, in the tenure process, uh, including you know, when, when, when that t tenure pre the pre-tenure review process goes on, or even if one is um, allowed to go up a tenure early, and how does that work within your universities? Could both mm -hmm. of you? Yeah. So, on that? 
<laughs> so thanks, Dr. Dr. Abraham. So I actually had a position prior to my hire as a visiting assistant professor. So having that title of assistant professor allowed me to negotiate time in rank when I was hired. Um, and so that's something we can talk about in addition to Dr. Abraham's discussion. Um, so uh, the pre-tenure process when, it, when I was hired was to have about three to four years to develop my uh, teaching portfolio, to develop a research program at the institution with students, and to also try the advice I was given as an assistant professor and that we still continue to give is to try to do some type of research, I'm sorry, some type of service um, and really get advice from some of the people that are more senior to you about what that service might be to protect your time and also to develop these allies that Dr. Whitehead is, is very nicely bringing to the forefront. Um, so we had a three or three year um, review process. And so that process is pretty structured at our institution. It's in our faculty handbook. Uh, one of the things I, I would recommend is that when you are uh, looking at institutions is to ask the, that question of what is your review process like? Um, is that spelled out in the faculty handbook? Because when there are situations where a department uh, chair maybe doesn't follow those guidelines, you can go back to that handbook and, you know, with your advocate and say, this is the timeline, you know, I should be receiving a review at this point. Uh, we have had situations more recently where we've had individuals that have gone through the review process and there were not major um, challenges or problems that were foreseen. And then later, uh, some interesting politics that happened during the tenure review process. And those of us who are allies and advocates stood up and said, no, we cannot do that. We have a letter that was provided to that individual following their third year review process with guidelines of what we, um, we advise that individual to work on as they get prepared for that full tenure package. And so um, I have to, uh, say, Dr. Abraham, I have come to learn that that process is not spelled out at a lot of institutions. So it is something that is definitely worth asking. Um, there's a question in the chat about service since I since we brought up this um, question of service. Uh, service outside of the institution is definitely recognized as well as inside the institution. But to speak to Dr. Whitehead's point is while you're preparing to go up for review, so pre-tenure review or for tenure, you do want to have some service within the institution because there are people in other disciplines at the university tenure committee level that will be evaluating uh, your package. So I always felt like I've got to have allies within my school and outside my school. Thank you. Dr. Whitehead, would you like to weigh in on that a little bit? Yes, and just to kind of get into the nuts and bolts of it. So I entered um, the academy in 2009. I was fresh off of finishing my dissertation. I had defended in the spring, uh, gone into recovery in the summer, and then started on the tenure track in the fall. But, but the process of beginning on the tenure track, and this is why I really think that examining the hiring process is even important because I was a graduate student at UMBC, a part of the SREB program, but I had worked for 10 to 15 years as an Emmy nominated television producer in New York. And so while I was getting ready to take my comprehensives, I was approached by Loyola University, Maryland, asking me, uh, would I be interested in taking a tenure track job? I had not even done my comps yet. I was just kind of figuring out the process of what I was going to do, but I reached out to my mentors and what they wanted, they wanted me to take a tenure track job in communication. Um, so with my background from actually doing documentary films, but going through graduate school, working on language literacy and culture, focusing on black women's history, I was concerned about how to connect the two. 
And so what I had asked them for is that if I come on the tenure track in communication, can it be an interdisciplinary position? So that way the work that I've done in the academy as a student, all my graduate work, I can find a place to have that fit. So I'm not just doing the same thing I was doing when I was in New York, uh, doing television. So what they offered me and what I negotiated for is that while I was working on my dissertation that year, as I took on kind of a almost similar to being an adjunct position, but it was a faculty fellows position that was created for me. And they gave me student researchers to help me. And so I had students who could help me put together my bibliography to finish my dissertation in a year so that I could graduate in 2009 and start in the fall of 2009 on the tenure track. I was working on a book. I wanted my dissertation to be a book. And I could not understand if I'm doing the book, how do I then turn my attention away and work on articles? And so I kept pushing my chair to note in my reviews every year to instead of looking to articles, look to my progress toward finishing my book. Did I get my book contract? Have I gotten my first draft done? What about getting my reviews out? And so for the third year pre-tenure review at our institution, as at many institutions, that third year review, some places fourth year review, that determines whether or not you're going to leave. A lot of people think, it deter you figure out whether you're gonna leave after you go through tenure and you don't get it. No, no, actually, if you're, you're really keeping your, your ear to the ground, that pre-tenure review, they're letting you know then whether you have a chance to get through or not, because they'll lay out for you in clear steps what you have to complete. And then I tell people, be honest with yourself and say, okay, I got three years, really it's two years because that third year of tenure, all you're doing is getting letters, finishing everything, you know, Xerox and copies in the old days of your dissertation binder. So you really have two more years. So the question I had to ask myself, when I looked at the checklist, could I get everything accomplished that the tenure committee would be looking for in two years? And I knew that my book was scheduled to come out in 2014. So I knew if I had that book in hand, because I had my contract, I had my first draft done, I knew I could make it, then I said, okay, I'm comfortable with moving forward because I will have at least checked the boxes that they've laid out. I pressed the, with the pre-tenure review, what I pressed was I want a checklist. I need a roadmap of what I have to accomplish. What is the tenure committee looking for? I always believe that, People get tenure in the old days a little bit easier than we get it now, but it's like everybody wants to make it harder for the person coming after them. And so they have all of these expectations that they didn't have to meet. So that's what was difficult for me. I did not do a lot of service for, for a number of reasons. One is because I focused on my teaching. I knew I was teaching race, class, and gender on a campus of predominantly white, uh, Catholic, upper middle class students, I was already fighting that hurdle of introducing race, class, and gender in this environment. So that was really difficult. A second hurdle is that we know that research shows that Black women traditionally get lower reviews when the students do the evaluation. So that was another hurdle. Third is also the unspoken labor that Black folks and Brown folks take on on campuses where we work so hard to show and prove our worth that we drain ourselves. For those reasons alone, I looked for faculty members to protect me and to protect my time. Because any, it doesn't matter how much service you do, if your teaching reviews don't show that you're moving towards some marker, and if you don't have that book published or those number of articles published, you can serve on every committee from now until the end. You can help rewrite the mission of the institution and you will not get tenure. It really, even though it's a three-legged stool, that one leg is longer. That research stool, even if you're at a predominantly undergraduate institution, where are you publishing and what is your publication rate? It is not publish a parish like Harvard, but even at my institution, what is your book? How many articles? Because it's still about that. And then second, what are the students saying about you? Even though we know the students are biased, are there consistent things that come out that you can't explain? And then, 
Did you do once one committee? And I did, I served on one light committee that my mentor recommended. They only met once a year. So I kind of checked that service box, but I really focused on those other two, which were large barriers to jump coming into the field. Well, obviously it paid off for you because you, 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 <laughs> you, you read the tea leaves very well because you got there. But um, not but, who, who, I think both of you may have touched on this, but in, in, the, in that process, would you all talk a little bit about at your institution who makes the who makes that tenure decision? Uh, what what is that process at um, your respective institutions? Veronica, why don't we start with you? So we actually have a school level. So we have departments uh, within the School of Math, Science, and Engineering, um, and that school level rank and tenure committee is comprised of members from each of the different departments within the school. And so um, the tenured faculty will review applicants for tenure uh, within our school. Um, and we have a discussion about uh, whether or not they've met the requirements based on what is in our handbook uh, for, faculty, for teaching service and for uh, scholarship. And so that recommendation is in the form of a letter. And that letter um, is sent to the university rank and tenure committee chair. So we have a school level committee and then that committee sends a recommendation to the university level committee. The university level committee of rank and tenure is comprised of representatives from each school. And so you have basically a university committee that is making the final recommendation um, based on um, your portfolio, but also taking into consideration the letter that came from the school and also the letter that came from your dean, which is required to go with your um, application to the rank and tenure committee. So we have a school level process, then a university level, and then the um, president will and school uh, board of trustees will decide. And as we know, and let's everyone's had their academic head under a rock for the last year. If, uh, anyone you know, that can also go awry if you're watching the case of um, Nicole Hannah Jones. We all kind of see how those processes um, can go sideways at times uh, when when mm -hmm. it's not managed well or correctly. Uh, Dr. Whitehead, you're, you're, what about at your, uh, at your institution? So, so there's kind of three things I want to lay out. Uh, one, at my institution, it is, it's similar. It's department to dean, to the board of rank and tenure, to the president, to the board of trustees. So it's kind of a, it's a streamlined process. So if you're, if your department doesn't support you, it's going to be hard all the way through. But say your department supports you. Your dean supports you, but the board of rank and tenure says no. Then you can appeal to the president uh, and the president may or may not overturn it. Now, if the president says no at our institution, like you're done, right? So it doesn't matter even, and there've been times when the school has, your, your, your department has supported you, your dean has supported you, the board of rank and tenure has said yes, and the president has said no. That happens. If a president has been at the institution long enough and has that kind of power, rarely do presidents who've only been there less than five years override the board of rank and tenure, the dean, the department. My, my president had been there quite a while. Uh, the second piece I wanna answer is someone put in the chat that someone who has a non-tenure track position but would like to get a tenure track position. I would recommend two things. Uh, one, find out what how your institution typically hires. Some institutions won't hire someone who's on, in a non-tenure track position for a tenure track position. They just don't have a, a record of doing that. If your institution does have that record, then what you wanna find out is how you can begin to speak to the chair so you can prepare a package for submission. Um, and then third, I just wanna note, um, that I think we should put the Nicole Hannah-Jones, who's amazing, as, as an outlier. I think for, for the rest yeah. of us, Yes. live and, and walk and breathe in this airspace. It, it 
it doesn't get to that level for us. You just get cut off at the knees before you even get there. Like you don't even have an opportunity to get the whole world behind you. Nevertheless, hire the best lawyers from the NAACP Legal <laughs> Defense Fund to, to state your case. Unfortunately for the rest of us, we just get cut off at the knees. We, we get told in some secretive way that we didn't meet the standard. Um, in terms of hiring, we get a simple call or not or our package gets denied. And that's why I think it's important to always keep a separate folder that outlines what you're doing. I always keep, whether it is, I served on the committee, it goes in my folder. Thank you notes from students go in my folder. Anytime I get an award, anytime I'm recognized, anytime I take the university's name beyond the campus, if I'm interviewed for something, that goes in my folder as proof that the work I'm doing goes beyond the institution. So I may not serve on 50 committees, but look at the ways I've taken the institution's name beyond the gates. And I think it's important for us to, to do this to protect ourselves from situations like that. Good. You're, you're touching on something I probably should have asked a lot earlier in terms of that, you call the folder, the part that the, the folio that you're, you're, you're keeping up with. Um, Dr. Costa, did you do the same thing of keeping I've talked to other, other um, graduates and, and that that piece of advice you just gave, I have heard over and over is you must keep track of everything you do. So when it comes time, to being able to regurgitate that you've got a written record in in a folio in in a folder somewhere that you've got everything dr costa did you do the same thing as well i did i did and my tenure portfolio was actually a binder so in many ways i felt like i was putting together uh not necessarily a, a scrapbook but i had um documents of writing to describe everything that I did for teaching, for scholarship, for service. And then I had examples. There were th the thank you notes. There were um, copies of presentations, uh, at least the flyer of where I was invited to speak. Um, just anything to show the record of what I did. Um, I actually did have a box <laughs> under my desk because I knew it was gonna be uh, something that was printed and turned in. Nowadays, there are electronic dossiers. Um, and so everything is scanned in and um, shared that way. But I did do that. Um, I would recommend to kind of speaking along these same lines um, is to think about uh, who might be your external reviewers and to start thinking about those early. I think that's one thing that I didn't do and I was sort of scrambling towards the end to think about who those external reviewers uh, for my tenure and promotion would be. Um, and that is because you get to suggest who those might be to the committee and then they'll reach out to individuals to then supply support for your tenure package. But that was something that I would also recommend. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Dr. Whitehead, anything else to add to, to that in terms of the preparation of a folio of your work? Because that was an excellent uh, segue to reminding me that I didn't ask that question early on, I should have about that, that, you know, the things, the way one must prepare oneself for um, the pre-tenure review and the, re and the tenure review process in terms of gathering information. Is there anything else that um, our, our um, participants, they should include in their folios and make, or make sure that they have as a part of that folio? So I want to lay out two things, um, probably uh, not very popular, but I, I'm going to put it out because I do think it's important that all of us right now are in the process of creating two identities. And, and this, let me tell you what I mean by that. We have our academic identity where we're on campus, we're doing our research, we're you know, communicating with colleagues and students, and then we have our online identity. And sometimes we get on social media, um, on Twitter, Instagram, and maybe we may say things and do things that we wouldn't necessarily say and do in person. And because I teach communication and I have seen examples 
Institutes where people have been denied tenure, not because their research wasn't stellar, not because of evaluations, but because they have this huge, big social media presence where they have said things that they thought were private and they are not. And so I, I, I talk a lot about how to reconcile the two. Um, you know, when I was coming through early on, this wasn't a big deal. I had a very small media presence, right? So I would be a lot more concerned about my media presence today if I was on the tenure track. Like I have a huge Twitter follow and I'm putting stuff out there all the time, but you also get followed by your colleagues. Uh, my president follows me. <laughs> so when you say something, you may be just joking. It may just be in the moment, but know that that I would argue is kind of that fifth leg, right? So if one leg is research, another is scholarship, and then a research service teaching, and then fit, this is other thing. And this is kind of the nebulous gray area of who are you in the world? And if the person you are in the world doesn't line up to who the institution is trying to be. So many of us, um, myself included, have entered in that gray area called being a public intellectual, right? And we, we do op-eds and we do think pieces, which don't necessarily count for tenure. So I tell people, you've just expended the energy doing five op-ed pieces when you could have really done an article because in the end, those op-ed pieces are not going to be counted for tenure because they're not peer reviewed in the same way that an article is. And so I tell people to think about who they are online and how much time are you, you spending there. Also remember that just like colleagues follow you, so do students, potential students and current students. And if you're delving into race, class, gender, everything from George Floyd to Breonna Taylor, the statements that you're putting out there, can you stand behind them? Is your work strong enough to think about that? I also believe that that people have a line in the sand where they're saying, you know what, if I stay quiet, you know, Zora Neale Hurston, they will kill me and tell me that I enjoy it, that I am willing to risk tenure because I can't stay quiet in this moment. Um, I, I did that. When, when Trayvon Martin, when his killer, George Zimmerman was exonerated, I said, I can't stay quiet more. I've got to delve into this. And I knew that my institution, either they were gonna support me or they were not. But I was very clear with my chair and with my dean that I cannot stay in the archives if I'm living in a world where my own black sons can't get home safely. So how do we rewrite what I'm doing where my public intellectual work becomes a part of my package? I was very intentional. And I sat with them and I helped them rewrite this. So when I went up for tenure, they had this whole document that said all this other stuff I'm doing, actually does matter because I'm engaging in real world teaching. There's a way you can do it by, by taking ownership and agency over it. I think the, uh, and I think the advice you're giving right here is really important for everybody um, who's tuned in is that, you know, when you work at an institution, regardless of whether you think you're on your private time, I mean, this is almost everywhere one works today. Uh, if you work for someone else and someone else is signing that check at the end of the month, um, one must be very thoughtful about, you know, even if it's in your private emails, you have to be very thoughtful about um, what you say and, and how you say it, because you're representing, whether you like it or not, other, 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 other entities. And it can blow back on you in some of the worst kind of ways. I mean, we see it every day every day uh, in all walks of life. And I mean, you can take from sports to academe to the business world, it, it can come back to haunt you. And I think that is the, the point you're making to everyone is you must be very, very thoughtful about what you put out, even in social media, because that is not your private domain. It can, it will, it will and does spill over into the academic community. For both of you, I just want to get a couple more questions in real quickly and then uh, open it up for some discussion from our um, our attendees. Um, what role um, do you think the lack of clarity regarding tenure and promotion 
plays in the, that faculty process. Um, you know, whether your these departments are, 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 you know, are these things very, when you got in, you got, you got a list of here, are the 10 things we're going to look at for you. Uh, or is it more or less, um, you know, who you talk as you, as we, we began the conversation, who you're talking to, the reconnaissance you're doing to get the information you need to get in order, in order to know how you are being evaluated. Um, what role do you think that lack of clarity? Because I think you all both have talked about, um, you've got you've to be somewhat um, a clairvoyant to, to understand if it's not you know, in your contract or part, it's not in the, your departmental guidelines, there, there's, there's room for mis, uh, misinterpretation, misjudgment. You know, can both of you um, mm -hmm. comment on that? Um, Dr. Costa, we'll start with you. I think that the lack of clarity that I've seen, um, even at my own institution, you know, I started off saying that we have this faculty handbook and that we have our guidelines are fairly set. It is one of the reasons I chose to go to the institution. But in practice, there's still wiggle room for individuals to interpret those guidelines in different ways. Um, and so I think that Transparency absolutely is a barrier um, to, to people persisting, particularly people who are black and brown in um, the academy. Um, I think that my advice based on my experience, um, so not every piece of uh, advice maybe for everyone, but was to seek out allies both inside and outside of my institution. Um, I knew that those three things were going to be what I was evaluated on. And if there were going to be misinterpretations of what I did, that I needed certain things to stand out. And so I needed to have my scholarship there so that there was no question that there was, you know, just, I wasn't just minimally um, bringing forward what was asked of me. So I did focus most of my time and, and valued that time to get my publications that were required of me done, to get the grants done. Um, I also reached out to uh, different mentoring groups uh, through my um, discipline. So Society for Neuroscience provided different mentoring groups uh, for me that were people that were outside of my institution. So there was this cone of silence, right? And I could ask a question about, is this, you know, right? This doesn't feel right. Uh, what can I do to combat that? Or what's another way that I can phrase this email to get the answer that I need in order to be successful? Um, I think that teaching wise, one of the things that uh, we do at our institution, but I also would recommend for anybody to do, would be to ask the students directly in your class to provide you feedback. Uh, for those first early years and to really take it to heart. It's, you know, you're putting yourself out there and we are judged often unfairly by students. Uh, some of them know the power they have. Some of them do not know the power they have. Um, but the evaluation, the student evaluation process of teaching is horrible um, and really should be, you know, revised. But that's another hurdle. So I would encourage you um, as you go forward is, is to ask for your own feedback from the students so that you can have that potentially as a part of your um, documentation when you go forward. Um, but yeah, absolutely. The, the unspoken rules are, are holding individuals back. And so when someone reaches out to me and asks me for how do I, how do, I do this? You know, this is what I'm facing at my institution. Then I then I feel it's my duty, right, to answer those questions because I have been through it. And, and that's the only way I, I feel that we can overcome it is by us speaking out more and helping those that are actually in the process. Good. Thank you. So Dr. that um, is with this notion of having mentors, what Dr. Acosta was talking about, but having mentors as, as I was taught, that you have what we call rings of mentors. So there's a mentor in the very first ring of someone who's inside your institution, who's at the next level or the next level beyond that where you want to be. Someone who can teach you about 
the inner workings of the institution. And then you have a mentor on the outer ring, someone who is at that level, but who is outside the university, who could not just help you understand the, you, the process of tenure, but also can make sure you're getting, um, you're moving through the field. Because you also want to think about how your reputation is growing within the field. Are you being asked to, to be on panels or to, to help you know, do scholarship with other faculty members at other institutions? Uh, finding out what is the mission of your school? Like I speak to professors and I say, what, what's your school's mission? They don't know. I'm like, you know what? Find out what the mission is. Because if, if you're getting, if you're seeking tenure, at XYZ University, I always tell people that part of agency is that I'm also providing tenure to you. It is a two-way street, that I'm not just on the market waiting to be evaluated. And then if I'm lucky, I get picked up. I'm also evaluating you. Do I want to marry this institution? Do I want to have this institution be the place that I come to every day? Do I want to marry these colleagues? When we're working together and co-laboring together, I tell people, if you hate your university and you hate your department, why would you want to be there? Like, you need to think about how you can write yourself out. Right, because there, there are two paths here when you come in. You get in the institution, like, you know, I hate it here. Okay, write yourself out. Because if you want to get out of that institution and get back on the track, then scholarship's important. Service is not that important. Service at this institution is not going to matter if you're back on the track. You got to write yourself out and keep that first and foremost in your mind. Can you see yourself growing at this institution? Who do you want to be at this institution? Because sometimes you get into these tenured jobs and that could be 10 to 15, 20 years you can be committing to this place. Uh, because the, the farther up you move, and I think this is very important to be honest about, the farther up you move in the process, the harder it is for you to move around, right? Like you have, like if you're going all the way up, the closer you get to full, the harder it is for you to go back on the track for someone else to hire you as full or hire you with tenure that you have moments where you want to use them to your advantage. Um, and I tell people that pre-tenure process is a good moment to your advantage. Reflect. Am I happy here? Do I want to be here? Have I looked around at the environment? Because if I don't want to be here, pre-tenure is also a good checklist for me to get my package together to get back on the market, right? And then right when you're getting ready to sign that letter, when they're offering you tenure, that's another point where you stop and say, okay, am I negotiating for the best package that I can get? I didn't work. I wasn't able to negotiate that much when I first got the job. Let me negotiate right here. Because I know that whatever I'm getting at associate, my next time for negotiation isn't going to be till full or until I win a major award or until another university comes after me. That those opportunities to be able to negotiate for a better package, to begin to create the job that you want to have. I think that part of that, and I, I keep coming back to this word because so many professors feel that they don't have this, is about agency. You benefit the institution. You are putting the institution's name out there. You are doing work under the banner of this institution. And so thinking about whether this is where you want to be no. as someone who had young kids i'm like do i want my sons growing up on this campus because i because they're going to be here with me am i in a campus where i can be my full and complete self because that was very important for me thank you so one one last question for both of you this is a short this is a short answer question <laughs> <laughs> you're what talking the, to me aren't you no you're no <laughs> <laughs> no what i want to do is get to the questions that appeared in the chat so i wanted to make sure our, our, um, our participants got a chance to um, have you all speak to their questions as well. So Dr. Costa, so what is the one thing you wish you had known about the tenure process? What's the one thing that you, had, you wish you had known about the process? Uh, I wish, I, I don't know so much about the process. Um, I, I think that the advice we've talked about right now was was very helpful with the process. But what I wish I had um, listened to is what I'll say okay. is okay. that I didn't have to do everything right. There's 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 this mentality of you've got these you know three things that you're going to be evaluated on, and that I, I'm going to have to do 
everything for every aspect of those three things. And I think that what I would recommend to my former self <laughs> is you can't do everything. It's not really possible. And so even within those different areas of teaching and scholarship uh, service and, and you know, fit, I would say to focus on the teaching and the scholarship for all the reasons that Dr. Whitehead just nicely explained uh, for the tenure process, process of that institution, but also for as you build your career, but to learn now <laughs> that you're not in a silo and that there are collaborators, there are people who are within the institution or outside the institution, maybe that you can delegate some of the things that you are trying to do within those different areas um, so that it doesn't just fall on you. Um, and then to know what, what you want. Uh, so again, speaking to what Dr. White had said, um, for things like service, I, you don't really have time in your first two years. But as I said, it's important to do something so that you can develop some allies along the way. Um, and so I was very, very strategic in the two pieces of service that I did at my, um, I guess my early pre-tenure years. One was to actually um, interact on some small university committee so that I could have um, some interaction with people who, who might be sitting on that university rank and tenure committee from some other school that maybe didn't know who I was. Oh, but she served on this committee with me and she was a great committee member. Um, so I think that, you know, having, you know, those pieces to leverage, but also just knowing that you don't have to do everything, but no. to, you can be picking and choosing what you want to do in those categories. Good. Thank you. Dr. Whitehead, okay. last, last word. What's the, last what's the one thing? Um, I, I was really, know about that process. Yeah, I wish I was thinking really hard uh, about <laughs> what you said. And, and I realized that I knew a lot about the tenure process. We haven't been involved with SREB, coming to the workshops every year. There was always a pre-tenure workshop that was being taught and I made sure that I, I showed up. I would tell you instead, because I, I felt very comfortable and very well prepared. What I learned, one thing I really learned uh, was how to trust myself and trust my voice that I made a leap and said, you know what, this is work. I'm doing this work because it's soul work and not just because it's work that's going to be sold. And taking that step that this is what I'm going to do and reshaping my experience at, the, at my institution way right back then is what led me to being able to launch an institute on race, class, and gender, where I've now created my own job of doing the exact thing that I said I was doing. I'm like, I'm going to just be the Black mommy activist, whether they tenure me or not. Way back then, not only had they tenured me, now I have a whole institute that my university is funding where I can be the Black mommy activist because I, I trusted my work, my time, my talent, and my treasure back then. Excellent. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. Um, Veronica, would you like to, are there a couple of questions that showed up in the chat um, that you could look at for me and um, pose to our panelists who have, <laughs> who've been talking and not had a chance to look at the, the chat questions, please. Okay, um, looks like um, we did get some answers, but um, I'll, I'll just read this out loud for those who may not have had an opportunity to read the chat. Um, is there a resource, a program that shows black and brown folks in academia that have gotten promotions and or tenure? Something similar to SREB, but at the next level. Um, SREB was remarkably helpful for me to see other black and brown people in the same spaces as me getting a PhD. I did not see that at my institution um, and I loved our annual SRP conferences. It's difficult when you don't see people who look like you in academia and don't see folks who look like you not getting promoted or tenured. Well, let me, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take a shot at answering. Part of that is that don't forget that, you know, all the, all the, um, 1,200 SRAB graduates are still in our database and still accessible to everyone. And I'm sure these, our graduates will be more than happy to engage you if there are issues and things that need to be discussed. I mean, that's why we have the directory and other platforms 
um, so that we can continue that conversation. You know, it's not like when you graduate, you always hear me say, when you graduate from the program, you just disappear and we drop you from, from communications with uh, the current and, uh, and, and scholars that have come before you. We try to keep the, the lines of communications open because we know how important it is for Dr. Costa, Dr. Whitehead, to have those avenues uh, and to, to give back to those that are coming through. Look, we're trying to make this a better process, not one where everybody has to ex experience the same level of pain to come through it to be, to be considered a graduate. We wanna make that process um, easier slash better for everyone. That's my two cents on it, answering that question as well. I added, um, and I agree, uh, I, I always share this with people. I was Miss Texas uh, way back in 2000, well, 2005 when we were um, together for SREB. Not really Miss Texas, but I was the right. one SREB. One SREB president. One SREB right. candidate right. in Texas. <laughs> but I have carried you know, this program with me as I've gone forward. Um, and Dr. Abraham is, is one of my mentors. I mean, I, I actually look to this program for support um, as, I, as I move through the academy. I think what I hear in the question is, is it speaks to me because you, you, know, you are often going to be the only one or there might be one other person. I, you know, you're just not going to have those models there at your institution and I hope that that changes. Um, so I reached out within my discipline I'm a neuroscientist, and so uh, I have been fortunate to also be a part of other programs within my discipline that did provide those models. And so it was sort of the, uh, the career faculty model where you have people who are not who are pre-tenure, um, but you have a place where you can come to, it's a safe space, and you can talk. And so I would encourage uh, those of you that are looking for that to also look within your discipline because there may be national organizations or national groups uh, where you can have that, those moments, those retreats. Um, I like the way that Dr. Whitehead uh, spoke about speaking to your soul, where you have these individuals who look like you that you can talk to about things. The other place that I'm very new to uh, is Twitter. <laughs> um, there's science. Twi Twitter was has been around for a little while, but I just joined uh, the Twitter world, and I have found um, so much support there. Uh, we have very um, active groups on Twitter, so there's um, that have been supportive and offered those models for me as well. I would add both of those. Um, one is thinking about your academic organizations. I was very intentional about that. And so I went to ASALA, which is Association for the Study of African-American Life and History, Carter G. Whitson's organization, because I wanted to see Black folks in the academy. Like I wanted to meet up with other Black folks and be in what I thought was a safe environment, which proved to be a safe environment. I joined the National Women's Studies Association, which is not even in my area, but they had a program, a mentorship program for black and brown uh, women of color. And so I wanted to be a part of that. I think that as someone who is not new to Twitter, like Dr. Acosta, <laughs> I'm on Twitter <laughs> nonstop, actually. Um, I don't look to Twitter for my community. I mean, because I talk about my dogs and my sons and everything else on Twitter and running. Um, but I do look to Facebook groups because there are a couple of groups like Binders of Women in Color in the Academy and Binders of Black Women. I go there um, because those are more supportive groups. With Twitter, you're going to get everything and everybody. But on the Facebook groups that are closed, I found places where we can actually ask very honest questions about the Academy and people will, will struggle through the experience with us, offering advice and guidance, and sometimes leaning in in a more active way, depending upon where they are in the academy. And Dr. A, I have to say that I have to chime off now. I have to I know go you, you, on you the radio. The drive time, you've got the drive time program to put on. I do understand. Um, but oh thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. We'll, we'll talk again soon. Yes, sir. Okay.
uh, Dr. Whitehead, for, for all of you, she, she has a drive, a, a drive time afternoon um, radio program that uh, is award winning. And that's where she's headed to very quickly because I think it's, she's on air at three o'clock. So she's running to get, to, to get on air. Um, Veronica, are there any other questions? Because I see we are right at our witching hour uh, for this, uh, this session. Um, while you look at those, Veronica, let me just tell everybody that this was, I mean, I should have said this at the very beginning, this is the first of two um, seminars on, or webinars, excuse me, on, on tenure. Uh, the second one will be on the 10th of August. Um, so tune in to that one where uh, Dr. Costa, Dr. Whitehead, and we will have a third um, person also joining us for that one. Um, Dr. Oscar Holmes will be joining us for that meeting, for that uh, webinar. But any, should we take one more, one more question uh, from the chat, um, Veronica? Or is there anything else? Or have we covered most of the territory that's been posed uh, in, in the chat? I think we've covered most of that information, uh, Dr. A, and I'm putting the link. I hope that, I hope I'm putting the link in the chat uh, for our second webinar, which again is next Tuesday, August the 10th at 2 p.m. Eastern. And thank you so much for everybody who took the time to join us. We hope that it's helpful to you. And also, if you would please, please um, fill out the survey um, that is also in the chat and um, give us your feedback so we can continue to bring this great programming to you. Dr. Costa, thank you again so much for stepping up and being here to uh, share, share your experiences with, uh, with those who tuned in. It is much appreciated always. You are quite welcome. And I'm looking forward to our next um, session. Yes, and talk to you next Tuesday. Yep. Thank you all very much, everyone, for tuning in today. Be, uh, join us next Tuesday, 2 o'clock Eastern. <laughs> Have a good rest of your days. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.